Well, good morning and welcome to the University Church Facebook Live event on the 17th Sunday after Pentecost, September the 27th, 2020, and uh, we hope that we find you safe and well. Um, just before we get started, I have a, a small favour to ask you to consider. If uh, on your screen that you're looking at, whether it's on your phone or tablet, laptop, whatever it might be, uh, if there's an icon there that says share, and you'd be willing to click that, that would be a really big help to us because uh, the more that we share our video presentations, uh, the more highly we get ranked by Facebook and then the more likely we are to appear in people's news feeds. So if you'd be willing to do that, just find where it says share and click on that, that would be fantastic. Now, as you know, uh, no doubt aware that the US has passed the uh, grim milestone of 200,000 deaths attributed to COVID-19. Um, what that means is, as the US has less than 5% of the world's population, we now have more than 20% of the global deaths. During this last week here where we're located in Ohio, our uh, governor, uh, Mike DeWine, and the lieutenant governor, John Husted, announced updates to Ohio's response to COVID-19. And we learned that there's currently um, almost 146,000 confirmed and probable cases of COVID-19 in the state. And 
uh, over 4,600 confirmed or probable uh, COVID-19 related deaths. And uh, counties in the west of the state are the ones leading in terms of new numbers. So the reason I mention this, even though I'm sure you all know it, is please remain vigilant, avoid gatherings wherever you can, wear your masks, stay physically separated from one another, sanitize as much as you can. Um, brothers and sisters, uh, clearly this isn't a sprint. Uh, we have found ourselves in an ultra marathon. Uh, we didn't sign up for this ultra marathon. We didn't train for it and prepare for it, but nonetheless, we're in the middle of it. So um, let's do all that we can to take care of each other as best we can. I'm sure you've noticed in this situation, this pandemic situation in which we're in, while at the same time uh, the country is embroiled in a new round of issues associated with uh, racism, while there's an election on the horizon and so on and so forth, all at the same time, that during this time, um, if you're anything like me, you found yourself bombarded with con contradictory information. Everything from poorly presented or poorly understood statistics to outright conspiracy theories. And then for our own part, each of us, we're challenged individually on the coherence between what we say, what we mean, what we do, and the outcome of what we do. So. Uh, that's a big problem, I think, even just understanding the connection between the first two of these, what we say and what we mean, is of course something that is culturally conditioned and different cultures use different ways of expressing themselves. Uh, I recently saw an article, it was targeted at a North American audience and it was entitled, Things British People Say and what they actually mean. Now, I noticed on the feed we have at least one person from the UK who clicked in here. I hope he's still here so he can uh, get a, a grin at some of these things. It's of course intended to be amusing, but the little article, it raised a good point about communication and how difficult it can be. So let me just give you just two or three examples here. Mm, maybe four examples. I had trouble trimming them down. So. According to these authors, when a British person says to you, oh, I might join you later on, what they actually mean is, uh, I'm not leaving my house today unless it catches on fire. Uh, when a British person says, oh, not to worry, everything's fine, what they actually mean is, I will never forget this. And when a Brit says, oh, it's okay, it's just fine, no problem, what they mean is, could it really possibly be any worse than this? I don't think it should, but I think it's going to. And then finally, when a British person sums up a situation by saying, oh, perfect, absolutely perfect, what they mean is, well, that's totally ruined then, isn't it? Um, this is a strange uh, little communication habit, and if you visit the UK, you will see people using this, where they say pretty much the exact opposite of what they actually mean but everybody familiar with it understands. And when we read the Bible, the words that we read are similarly culturally, culturally conditioned and the speakers use different ways of expressing themselves that they all understood, but maybe we don't. For example, at the telling of parables and almost constant references to the history of the people are two of the ways we see biblical authors uh, use the communication devices when they're talking. And of course now they're talking to us across many, many centuries and across a huge cultural divide. For example, uh, today's lectionary uh, psalm reading is from Psalm 78. It's the first four verses and then verses 12 to 16. And the, um, the psalmist refers to parables, 
and calls on a shared history. So uh, let's just hear those, hear those words. The psalmist says, give ear, O my people, to my teaching, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. In the sight of their ancestors, he worked marvels in the land of Egypt, in the fields of Zoan. He divided the sea and let them pass through it and made the waters stand like a heap. In the daytime, he led them with a cloud and all night long with a fiery light. He split rocks open in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of a rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. May God add a blessing to our hearing of this word. So you see how the psalmist refers to parables but calls on a shared history in order to communicate his thoughts. And of course, if we don't know what that history is, it's very hard to understand what he's trying to say. And in fact, many parables rely on the hearers having a shared history or an understanding of a shared history in order for the parable to make sense. And we'll see that today. Let's take a moment though and pray together about all of this. God of all creation, author of salvation, giver of all grace, uh, we pray that we might seek coherence between what we say, what we mean, and the outcome of what we do. Lord, we pray that our words and our deeds might be as one. We pray that our words will pass the test of time. Are they true? Are they kind? Are they helpful? Are they necessary? Do we mean what we say? and say what we mean. We pray that our actions might align with our words, that our words and our deeds might be as one. As we pray for the sick, do our words truly reflect what we mean, what we will do, and the outcome of what we will do? Do our words lead to deeds that reflect our meaning and intention? Lord, we pray that our words and our deeds might be as one. Help us, Lord, as we pray for those experiencing economic hardship, those living under the brutal weight of racism, those who are fighting wildfires in the uh, West or coping with the destruction wrought by hurricanes in the Southeast. We pray that our words and our deeds might be unified and lead to outcomes that are reflective of them. Lord, we pray that our words and our deeds might be as one. In the name of the Word made flesh, the one who dwelt among us and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we, play, we pray. Amen and amen. Um, so friends, while I was praying that, I, I um, received a couple of messages here. Uh, I think something may have not come together in terms of uh, video sharing properly this morning. So if anybody's able to share uh, this link with uh, our friends, uh, Bob Ball, Anne Roosh, and uh, I think Lisa Craig, some of you know all three of those people. I'd really appreciate that because um, they're having trouble finding this uh, feed on Facebook here so um, maybe I made a mistake in how I shared it or something like that in which case I apologize uh, but it would be nice if somebody could share that with them so that's uh, Bob Ball, Anne Roosh and Lisa Craig that would be great thank you so um, friends as we're thinking about uh, what we say what we mean what we do and the outcome of what we do uh, let's keep all of that in mind as we hear today's New Testament gospel passage from the lectionary, which is from the 21st chapter of Matthew's gospel. And we're going to read verses 23 to 32. 
So just as a, as a warning, this passage contains a parable, which we mentioned was one communication device. But it turns out that to understand and read the parable well, you also have to catch the references to the historic story of the people of Israel. So here we go. I'm going to read it to you. When he, Jesus, entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin they argued with one another if we say from heaven he will say to us well why then did you not believe him but if we say of human origin and we're afraid of the crowd for all regard john as a prophet so they answered jesus we don't know and he said to them neither will i tell you by what authority i'm doing these things what do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Now, which of the two did the will of the father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So friends, this story, one of the things we always ask when we start reading a story from a scripture is what's the setting? Where is this all happening? And the answer to that is it's all happening in the temple in Jerusalem. Now, prior to this, we saw one of these classic examples where somebody's deeds did not match up with somebody else's expectation of their deeds and their words. Previously, we read, as Jesus came into the city, a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest heaven. You might recognize that as a text that we often use on uh, Palm Sunday. And what we know is that there are lots of symbols in there that are to do with the idea of the entry of a king into a city. And the people interpreted that, that Jesus was entering the city as a warrior who was going to do battle with the Romans. And they had all sorts of expectations. And it turns out that Jesus didn't really mean to do any of those sorts of things. He had something else entirely in mind. Prior to this story we've just read also, we read about Jesus's, what's called his first entry into the temple. So Jesus goes into the temple and what happens is he drives out everybody who's selling and buying in the temple. He overturns the tables of the money lenders and money changers. Uh, he throws around the, uh, the tables of those who are selling doves and things like this that we use for sacrifices. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. So once again, uh, the people had a certain expectation of what should occur within the temple. Jesus's expectation is apparently entirely different. And so uh, he says things there that call upon the ancient story of the people of Israel. My house shall be a house of prayer and talks about how they have corrupted that. They have not taken its meaning seriously. So um, after that event, then, with the money changes, uh, Jesus leaves, he goes to Bethany, he spends the night there, and in the morning he comes back in to the city and re-enters the temple. 
This is the second entry into the temple. And that's where our story today picks up. His authority is immediately challenged. We're told that the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? Now, Jesus, um, who of course rarely answers a question with a, a straightforward answer, he responds to this question with one of his own. He says to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? Now, this is an important question in uh, the narrative here. Uh, one commentator writing on this passage says, it's a question which plays to the crowd, to the crowd's sense that John spoke truth and that there's something hollow about the teaching of the authorities, something which stinks about their closeness to the Herods. They cannot refuse to answer, but either answer will undermine their power. So what to do? Now we're told that they argued with one, one another. They're worried about perceived incoherence between what they say and what they do. So they say, now if we answer this, if we say from heaven, that this authority for John came from heaven, he, Jesus, will say to us, well, why then did you not believe him? But if we say his authority was of human origin, they said, well, we're afraid of the crowd. They all regard John as a prophet. So no matter what they say, they can't find anything that they can do that won't reveal an inconsistency between word and deed. And so what happens is they have to answer Jesus by saying, we do not know. And in their society, of course, this is a, a question of honor and shame. They have now been shamed by uh, having to reveal their own ignorance before a huge crowd of people. And honor and shame were uh, very, very important in the, the dynamics of the society at the time of Jesus. And Jesus makes sure that everybody else knows what's going on because he says, well, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. In fact, uh, it's only at the very end of Matthew's gospel that Jesus really reveals the extent of his authority. You'll recall that he says at the end of Matthew's Gospel, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. But at this stage, that hasn't been revealed. And so Jesus then asks a question and tells a parable. He says, what do you think? That's the question. And then he launches into a parable. It's often called the parable of the two sons. Now, both the question and the parable relate to the earlier subject under discussion. Uh, did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? You'll recall uh, in Psalm 78, where it speaks of parables. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known, that our ancestors have told us. Now, knowing all of that, Jesus then says, a man had two sons. Now, how does that fit with things we have heard and known that our ancestors have told us? Well, the idea that there's a man with two sons is a theme. It's uh, rooted in the narrative of the people of Israel, Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, Aaron and Moses, etc., etc. Many, many stories about two brothers. And so this parable about two brothers is supposed to call on this historic knowledge that the people have of stories about two brothers. Now, the, the tradition of these stories, uh, one author I think correctly says that it's a tradition laden with motifs of envy, of betrayal, struggles for power, and sometimes reconciliation, but not always. And so brothers in the narrative of Israel are important. 
Now, Jesus calls the, uh, the brothers or the sons in this parable children. Just as Israel is often identified as God's children, and the action takes place in and around a vineyard. And we've talked many times about how the image of a vineyard is the stock symbol for the people of Israel in the Bible. Whenever you read a story about a vineyard, it's almost certainly a story that's really about the people of Israel. And so, um, as one author writes, Jesus is therefore not asking his adversaries to comment on random fictitious brothers, but to locate themselves within Israel's foundational and continuing stories. This is hard. I think it's, hard. it's even harder for us, the challenge to locate ourselves within a foundational and continuing story. As I mentioned at the beginning, the more we're bombarded with dubious information and strange uh, stories about origins of things, this is going to becomes even harder to do, to locate yourself within a foundational and continuing story. But here it is, the parable. It's not very long. A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. So remember now, whenever we read, go and work in the vineyard today, it's kind of a coded message that really means go and work among the people of Israel today. So what matters in responding to a direction like that? Is it what you say or is it what you do? Imagine if we were to uh, be talking about going and working among the people of Toledo today, say, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked and so on. What matters in, as an outcome of that? Is it what we say or is it what we do? So uh, if the responses of the brothers are that one says, I won't go, but changes his mind and does. And the other says that he will go, but changes his mind and doesn't. And so the question that's posed is, which of the two did the will of the father and the answer is given? They said, the first. So now, what on earth has all of this got to do with John the Baptist, which is really the question that's being explored here? Well, one uh, commentator writes about this, that Jesus uses this exchange to expose what the leaders really thought about John. The chief priests and elders' failure to believe and respond to John reveals the truth about where they stood and thus which brother they actually represent. He goes on to say that Jesus's authority, in contrast, is affirmed by the integrity of his words and actions, as well as by its outcomes. So we talked at the beginning about uh, our words, what we say, what we mean, our deeds, and the outcome of those deeds. And what we're striving for is coherence between those things. So what we say is clearly understood, and that was what we mean. Uh, what we do lines up with what we say and what we mean, and that the outcome that comes from it is what we intended when we first started to talk. And this author says that Jesus is affirmed by the integrity of his words and actions as well as by its outcome. So it seems that Jesus has got this down, and maybe we haven't. Uh, Jesus finishes up in an interesting way by saying, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God, of God ahead of you. So the question here seems to be one, not just of who heard the message, but who heard and responded, and who heard and chose not to respond. And of course this all, this all has consequences. We read that John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him, and even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. 
Uh, we could talk all day about that. Well, I could talk all day about that little fragment. You probably wouldn't appreciate it after the first three or four hours. But if we got really warmed up on this, what you see in this passage is Jesus revealing his understanding of belief. Remember, it says, John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. So the whole passage is about belief. And what is Jesus talking about? Well, if we were to dig our way through this in great detail, we would discover that belief is not simply hearing and accepting, according to Jesus. Belief, according to Jesus, is hearing, trusting, and accepting, and responding. So the elements of trust and response are built into Jesus' understanding of belief. Now, you might think um, I'm making a, a big fuss about this idea about what we say and what we do, what we say, what we mean, what we do and the outcome of what we do. It turns out uh, that the relationship between these things is, I think, absolutely fundamental to trying to understand anything about the nature of God. The relationship in particular between word and deed, you will know if you've... Uh, listened to our conversations about this sort of thing before that in the Hebrew Bible in Hebrew there is but one word that covers both word and deed the word is devar and devar we can translate into English as we have two words word and deed in Hebrew there's only one word the two things are so intimately associated with each other, you can't, you don't even have different words for them here. Um, one lexicon describes uh, the Hebrew word devar, uh, the word spoken as well as the actual thing or matter spoken of. And they use the example as I also always use, which is in the creation narrative, God says, let there be light and there was light. Um, the words and the deed, which is the creation of the light, and the outcome, which is light shining everywhere, all of these things happen together perfectly. Let there be light and there was light. The word and the deed, the outcome, the meaning, they all line up perfectly with each other. In fact, you could argue that uh, when you read scripture, whenever the word is of God, then there's 100% coherence between word, deed, and outcome. Now for us, if we're made in the image of God, we should be striving for 100% coherence between word, deed, and outcome. What we say, what we do, what we say, what we mean, what we do, and the outcome of what we do, all of these things, we're looking for complete coherence between them all. Uh, and when there is no coherence between what we say what we mean, what we do, and the outcome of what we do, we wind up with the sort of situation um, that was described by um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who wrote, what you do speaks so loudly that I cannot hear what you say. This sort of commentary on this idea of incoherence between word and deed. So, are there general principles that we can use here in terms of words and deeds that would be helpful to us? Well, I think there are, and in the United Methodist Church, many of you know that there are about, uh, three rules, the three general rules of the church, there's only three. Uh, the first one is about doing no harm. So in, it's important to do no harm with our words, with the meaning of our words, with our deeds, and with the outcome of our deeds. Do no harm. Uh, the second uh, rule in the United Methodist Church is about doing good. And when you read the whole passage in the uh, general rules, it talks about being in, being in every kind merciful after their power as they have opportunity, doing good of every possible sort as far as possible to all. So this is a way of reaching out to all people doing good. 
So the deed here is intended to be good, which implies that the words that go with it and your intention should also be good. So do no harm to all the goods you can. And then the third rule, um, when it was originally written, was in slightly old fashioned language. The third rule is by attending upon all the ordinances of God which I usually paraphrase, it's not my paraphrase, but it's been used by many others, to mean stay in love with God. What it means is to pay attention to things like worship, prayer, scripture, sacrament, that type of thing, all together. And so there should be then coherence between what we say, like if you say, I'm a follower of God, what you do, the church would suggest that should involve worship and prayer and scripture and sacrament, that you should uh, do those things in ways that bring about good, that do not do harm. So uh, as we're thinking about this here, we have an opportunity to provide a witness to the world in essence. If we can really think about what we say, what we mean, what we do and the outcome of what we do and we can get those things to cohere with each other that's a very powerful witness because almost nobody is doing that right now. Those of you who've been listening to things by uh, politicians, things by people who are very upset about uh, the pandemic, all of this sort of thing, there's complete incoherence between uh, what is said, what's done, what it means, and so on. So struggling for this coherence is very, very important. And you do it by following the three rules. Do no harm, do all the good you can, stay in love with God. If you do it well, you have coherence between what you say, what you mean, what you do, and the outcome of that. So how about maybe this week, in the days ahead, you maybe pick one thing and say, I'm going to be extremely careful about my discourse on this one subject. Let's say, for example, the upcoming presidential election. I'm going to be extremely cautious in my discourse. I'm going to talk in ways that I believe do no harm. I'm going to talk in ways that do good. I'm going to talk in ways that reflect the fact that I'm in love with God. What you say, what you mean, what you do, and the outcome. Now, that doesn't mean you, you can't uh, be honest and say what you think. In fact, I believe it requires you to be honest and say what you think. But you can say what you think in ways that make sense to people, or maybe not, and then your actions would need to line up with those. So perhaps we could just pick one thing and try it out for a week and see how it works. I think it would uh, really make the world a much better place in this very difficult time in which we're living right now. Now, speaking about words and deeds and how they fit together. How about we take a moment and we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And listen to the words that Jesus encourages us to use and think how those might motivate us and move us into action. So Jesus says to pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So brothers and sisters, as we move into the week before us, who knows what will happen? 2020 has been... Uh, full of surprises, hasn't it? But as we move into this week together, it's my prayer for each one of you, that the Lord bless you and keep you, that the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, that the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now, brothers and sisters, as we're working to try and make our, our words, the meaning of our words, our deeds, and the outcome of our deeds all fit together, uh, especially in our work throughout the community, I would encourage you, if it's possible, for you to support our work uh, with your gifts and tithes and offerings. Um, I think that Heather posted uh, some information about that into the chat for this session here, but if you missed that, we have a text to give number, 
419-987-4075. Uh, you can visit our website, the University Church Toledo org click on donate or you can support both us and the postal service by putting a check in the mail and sending it to the university church 4747 hill avenue toledo ohio 43615 uh, brothers and sisters maybe we could take a moment and uh, pass the peace with each other uh, you can do this using the chat function on here it's where you say to somebody may the peace of god be with you and they respond by saying and also with you. So brothers and sisters, from me to you, may the peace of God be with you. God bless you. Have a fabulous week. Amen.